Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming and joining us today after lunch. I know you are quite sleepy, but I hope this is going to be a very exciting talk. Um, Hinnick is going to be talking to us a little bit about like SSL, you know, that thing we use. Uh, please, a big round of applause for Hinnick. Yes, the on, yes. So, uh, quick poll. Uh, who knows the difference between SSL and TLS? Okay, okay, okay. It's good, good. The rest of you is either shy or in a very right room. So, I'm Hinek. This is how I look on the internet. Um, <laughs> when I'm not loud on Twitter or writing some open source software for greater good, I'm doing infrastructure at a small but friendly German web hosting company called Vario Media where if you speak German, you get your, all your domains from. But I'm not here to talk about myself. I'm here to tell you uh, that those shiny lock icons to tell you that you're safe because of military-grade encryption are a lie. <laughs> In fact, uh, you're ne never really safe. And while this statement may have seemed a bit uh, controversial last week, I assure you um, that in the grand scheme of things, absolutely nothing changed since last Sunday. Um, you simply need to know how things fit together in order to assess and minimize risks. And uh, you, you and your usage of TLS and SSL can do much more damage than any bug will ever do. So, before we do our first step together, <coughs> let me introduce you the only link I have to write down today. Every other link and project and further material I will be mentioning today will be there. Especially more material to dive deeper into the uh, concepts I'm introducing because as you may think, 40 minutes for a such complex uh, topic like uh, TLS is way too little. So, for now, just relax and enjoy the show. What is, why is the state of SSL sorry? Maybe we should start at ground zero and discuss what it actually is. So what's SSL? And what the hell has it to do with TLS? I think those terms are best explained with a short history lesson because everybody loves history lessons. And our particular one starts in the mid-90s when Netscape thought it might be pretty cool if entering your credit card number on the internet would entail people buying drugs out of your money. And so in 1995, they released the completely host SSL2 as the foundation for HTTPS, where the S stands for secure, not for SSL. And they fixed the worst, wor worst words one year later with SSL3. And another three years later, it finally became an official IETF standard and was renamed to TLS. So again, SSL is a product from Netscape from 1996. TLS is an official standard for 15 years now. So uh, basically, I tricked you in here with the name. But everybody knows that alliterations are always awesome, and I wanted to reach everyone I could. So if I had to trick you in with a name, I hope you learned the first thing today and will stop saying SSL in the future. In 2006 and 2008, the largely ignored TLS 1.1 and 1.2 have been released. Uh, both fixed several security problems, brought really nice features, but nobody cared. Fast forward last year. For some totally random reason, people started scrutinizing our security habits again, and what they found was really not very good. <laughs> so, for one, all mainstream browsers supported only TLS1 until last year, so TLS1 from 1999. And the discoveries from um, last year changed everything. The times we're just using TLS are gone. Um, for, for myself, it rather makes me very uh, suspicious than reassured when some software claims to be secure because of TLS. Uh, actually, they mostly say SSL, which makes me double uh, suspicious. So, you really need to know roughly what you're doing, because this technology has still very sharp edges, and getting it wrong can have very grave consequences. So, what does TLS actually want to provide you with? First, there's peer identity using certificates. So you can verify you're connecting to the uh, peer you actually wanted to connect and not to some crook who tricked you into connecting to their server. Then it gives you confidentiality using encryption. So um, 
people eavesdropping on your network, which is not uh, any dark magic, can sniff out your secret and your password. This is what most people think of when they think of SSL, TLS, and crypt uh, or cryptography in general. But it's only a third of the whole package. The last part is um, message integrity. So uh, you, it, the protocol is able to detect when packages arrive mangled, out of order, multiple times, or not at all. So that's that's basically TLS in a nutshell. Now let's look um, how to use those and explain further details along the way. So after a spot, you'll be able to um, spot the worst smells of poor TLS usage, and you will know what to avoid. And we will start with servers. Unless noted, I'm sticking to OpenSSL throughout the rest of the talk because that's what you will most likely be using, whether you like it or not. So. And if you deploy server software, it's a duty to ensure the maximum security for your users because they can neither see nor affect your setup. So the first step is to use at least halfway up-to-date versions of third-party software. If you deploy anything older than these versions today, you are being negligent, lazy, and should stop doing so. And I'm generously assuming that you have installed all the security back, back ports and patches from your distributions. These are the feature releases you need to have a, a halfway secure setup of your TLS. If, if you don't <coughs> use the relevant backports, there's obviously no, no way you are deploying an OpenSSL older than 1.0.1G, which came out Monday, as you may have heard. <laughs> so, the first thing you do when a client connects to you is that you present them a certificate that says who you are which the client should verify. Um, in order to make the client actually trust the certificate you sent it, uh, it has to be signed by a trusted third party called a, a Certificate Authority or CA. The set of all public keys of all trusted CAs that can be used to verify these, uh, these signatures is what we call a trust database or trust store or system keyring. It depends on the architecture and the, um, the operating system, how it's called. And to prove the certificate is actually yours, after all, you send it out to everyone. So a secret key belongs to each certificate. This key is then used for signatures that can be verified with the certificate. And they prove that you're actually in a possession of the secret key. Or that you found a server with a heartbleed. So <laughs> in the simplest case, CAs vouch that they verified that a certain host name belongs to you by checking that you gave them money and control a DNS for the domain. That's called hostname verification, and those certificates are really cheap, and um, you, I think you can get them even for free nowadays. On the other side of the spectrum is extended validation. That obviously also means extended payment, and um, that gets your company name into the URL bar. And that's basically all there is to know. Information about validity plus signature from trusted third party equals certificate. Your job now is to make sure that your certificate setup is trustworthy because your TLS is really worthless if the connecting clients have no way to verify your identity. So you won't get a certificate from signed by a trusted third party, um, but you get a so-called chain file that contains one or more intermediate certificates that complete the trust path to one. So in this case, uh, the Edge Trust CA signed some Komodo certificate, which in, in turn signed some other Komodo certificate, which in turn finally signed my certificate. Now, when a client connects, it gets all three of them, and then it can verify the trust chain. So take care of the trust chain. Forgetting chain certificates is a typical rookie mistake. Ensure that the certificate is valid for the host name of your server. And finally, make sure that uh, the certificate is not ex expired, because otherwise people will make fun of you. There is enough uh, uh, like Nagios plugins and everything, it will warn you in time, so don't let it happen to you. <laughs> Next, disable SSL2. Chances are it's not necessary, but for instance, Apple's, Apple's OpenSSL still needs that. Not that I'm suggesting in any way that you should deploy servers on OS X, because you absolutely shouldn't. So um, if you don't have to support some ancient operating system like Windows XP, disable SSL3 as well. And finally, disable TLS compression to avoid crime attacks. That's about it. The next objective is to configure your Cypher suite such that every client gets the best possible encryption. And the best, in this case, means the most secure and also the fastest. 
And a cipher suit is just a tuple of various cryptographic primitives, one of them being the cipher itself, that are used together to secure the connection. And ultimately, the server has the last say about which cipher suit is used. So use that power for, <coughs> for good. And the cipher itself is the easiest to explain, but we will start with them. You can just imagine it as a black box. It takes a plain text, plain text data and a key as input and return cipher text which should be ideally indis indistinguishable from random data as output. TLS ciphers are symmetric. That means that if you want to decrypt your cipher text, um, the relevant function of the cipher needs the exact same key as the sender to be able to decrypt it. So far, I think it's pretty straightforward. Things get more complicated um, because most ciphers, are not, maybe not most, but the currently most popular ones are block oriented. That means you can't just put a one gigabyte move into it and waiting for the ciphertext to come out. If your data is bigger than a ciphertext, uh, than a cipher block size, which usually is 128 bits nowadays, you have to chop it up. If it's smaller, you have to pad it. So obviously, usually you have to do both. And um, the most common way to do that is uh, cipher block chaining, which unfortunately was implemented and I think also spec'd poorly in TLS, which bestowed us with a wide variety of attacks. I think the most known one is Beast. So the most common, way, um, common ways to avoid that uh, are still client-side fixes and stream ciphers like RC4 in the past and ChaCha20 in future. Um, yeah, that's basically the current state. Then TLS 1.2 brought a shiny new mode called the Gala counter mode, which does much more than just uh, chopping and padding, but more about that later. So now we know what ciphers uh, are, which one to use. So I would say that the two best current ciphers are AES 128 in the Gala counter mode and the stream cipher ChaCha20 from Dern Bernstein. Now AES GCM is better in hardware and ChaCha is better in software. So ideally, you'd support both and let the client decide which one to use. And it's actually what Google does nowadays. Unfortunately, it's not really uh, available to us mere mortals. So example, ChaCha20 is not in OpenSSL yet. It's only in Chrome. But as far as I know, they are working on it to get it out. Until then, AES GCM it is for now. So even for the latest Safari and IE browsers, you'll have to fall back to AES CBC. Same cipher, different mode. Works perfectly fine on TLS 1.1 and 1.2, but not so much on TLS 1. Again, Beast and concerts. So uh, you don't have really much choice yet than uh, hoping that the client has the relevant fixes in, in it, which fortunately by now uh, is true for all mainstream browsers. So Apple was the last one. So, and if you need to support ancient clients, read Windows XP in a web world, but there are others. I would suggest triple this, which is a decent but very slow cipher. The three basically means that it takes the DES cipher uses three times. So you can imagine it's not the most effi efficient thing to do. And that's it. You don't need anything else to support everything you will ever encounter on the net. And be especially wary of the following ones. So export ciphers were intentionally weakened when exports of crypto software were um, from the US were restricted. So Avoid them at all costs. They are designed to be easily crackable. DES is a this uh, ancient cipher with 56-bit keys, uh, so it can be brute forced pretty easily. So avoid it also. And finally, RC4 is a bit more complicated. Some people consider it as the silver bullet to all of the mode problems that, uh, which the block ciphers have uh, shown over the years. But on the other hand, all notable cryptographers I know of are of, um, of the opinion that it may be broken in ways that uh, national agencies may be already able to decipher it, or they will be very soon. So based of, on what I've heard from people who are way more smart than I am, I would generally advise against that. So in order to encrypt and decrypt, ciphers needs a key. And since we are uh, talking about symmetric encryption, it has even to be this identical key. So we need a way to agree on, on keys over for to encrypt a connection which is not encrypted yet. So we have a nice chicken egg problem. Fortunately, math came to the rescue and gave us several ways to uh, exchange keys over an insecure line without leaking the keys. And of them, three are currently deployed. First, there's RSA, 
which is not just a company that took a lot of money from the NSA, but it's, it's also um, a public key crypto system. So basically, you have a public key, a secret key, public key for encrypting, secret key for decrypting. Straightforward, the usage in TLS is uh, very straightforward too. But as soon as the secret key bleeds out of the server, um, <laughs> I prepared that one. <laughs> <laughs> All future and past communications become plaintext to the attacker. So we say it lacks perfect forward secrecy or that it's not PFS. This bears really repeating. Uh, one court order, one CVE, or one server break in, and the thief can decipher everything they captured, capture, and will capture. This is really bad. Well, but it's fast. So, peop so especially operation folks really like it. Uh, the alternatives used to be uh, ephemeral Diffie Hellman which is PFS, but slow, so ops don't, don't like slow. And finally, nowadays, we have the uh, r relatively new ECDHE, which is the elliptic crypto version of DHE, which means it's faster and it's basically more secure. And you should really do everything humanly possible to ensure perfect forward secrecy to everyone. And for that, you will need e both ECDHE and DHE. And since ECDHE is faster, I su suggest to prefer, prefer it. And RSA should be really just a fallback. It's it should really only if you have to. So finally, message authentication codes, or MACs, are used for message integrity. Messages in TLS just means uh, TLS records, so a lump of data that is sent out and um, received and unpacked. The Macs are not TLS specific. Don't let the word uh, message con uh, confuse you in any ways. So they combine some magic crypto dust together with uh, shared secret keys to ensure both the integrity and the authenticity of single messages. So if you have a message, you know that this exact message, how you have it, um, was sent by the person who knows the shared secret key in that order. So TLS uses a so-called kid hash mac or hmac for that at least um, and before that SSL used something similar but slightly different then in TLS 1.2 um, it was introduced that um, ciphers can bring their own mac with them and this is where the aforementioned Galois counter mode shines because it integrates the message authentication within the cipher mode which means it's not an ex extra step it can be uh, nicely implemented in hardware this is the future. So, finally, if your list does not contain only uh, strong, perfect, forward, secure uh, ciphers, make sure that your own list and order of ciphers has the higher priority, because it's it's worthwhile to have the latest and greatest um, TLS implementation. If the client sends you a list with RSA triple dash at the top and you comply, although you could both have done ECDHE AES GCM. So, and if you've done what I've told you here, you're basically done. <laughs> However, thinking that you've got it right does mean absolutely nothing. You need to test your results. Uh, there's really a, much, a lot of confusing stuff that can happen. So for example, I've just run into um, rel slash CentOS 6.5, which has a decent OpenSSL now, but their Nginx is still compiled against the op old OpenSSL. That means that OpenSSL tells you, oh yeah, I can do ECDHE, no problem. And then you scan your own uh, Nginx and it tells you nope. So always test it. And if your server is HTTPS, it's your lucky day because then you can just use the Qualys SSL server test. And since it's a pretty common case, I figure I'm going to show you how to read its output using the results of my homepage. I like to uh, stress that they test much more than I will be able to talk about. So after you've done the basics I introduce, uh, go back and get it as green as possible. Always aim for an A+. Plus. It's not that hard. So this certificate is valid for my homepage both with and without triple W. It's valid from March until next May. And it's a 4K RSA key. In this case, that means that RSA is used for uh, cryptographic signatures, not for key exchange. It's the same algorithm, but it's a different use case, and it has completely different implications. Other possibilities would be uh, DSS, 
which nobody uses, and ECDSA, which is gaining some traction lately because it's faster, truth, but um, it's grossly undersupported by both CAs and clients. So you first have to find a CA that signs your key, and then you have to find um, now, and then you have to do a dual certificate setup like Google does, so you support both. Um, as for RSA keys, 4K is the current state of the art key size. 2K is barely enough, and 1K is a serious security problem. So, it was issued by the Komodo CA, and they signed the certificate using RSA and SHA 2, which is nice. SHA 2 is what you should be uh, striving in nowadays. SHA 1 has been mostly uh, been deprecated, even by the NIST. So, oh, it has no extended validation because I don't support that kind of record, and um, it's not revoked, and that thus it's uh, trusted, which is wonderful. So, protocols. Always ensure that TLS 1.2 and 1.1 are active, and SSL 2 is inactive. Because we have customers that demand Windows XP support even now, we have to keep SSL 3 on, but if you don't uh, carry that burden, Drop it. So, Cypher Suites, there we go. There it is, the currently best widely supported Cypher Suite, if you want to have it up there. Yeah, it's readable, nice. So, let's look at it in detail. It uses the fast and forward secure ECDHE for key exchange. It uses RSA for signatures, which is not something you can configure. It's depending on the type of your key. Um, the Cypher is already priced AES-128 in Gala Condor mode. And finally, it uses SHA-256 for key derivation. Uh, if the cipher was, were a classical one that uses external HMAC, it would also use this hashing function for the HMAC. But it isn't, so it won't. Um, as you can see, the cipher strictly prefers PFS ciphers over non-PFS ones, which are, again, just because of Windows XP there. Uh, however, it's a rather privileged browser view. If you are deploying something different than a web application, compared to IE6, some, some especially mail s server setups, which are some intern setup in the 90s and it's still running, it can look like a sweet dream. So your mileage may vary, vary here. So let's talk about writing client software next. And it turns out that browsers aside, the client side is of TLS is in the worst shape of all, which is slightly odd because they have only one job, verify. Verify the certificate the server sends you. Is it valid or is it expired? Is, does the trust chain validate? And finally, is the certificate valid for the host name you wanted to connect to? Especially host name verification is in a, such a pathetic state, there's even a scientific paper about it, how software does not verify host names. So. And unfortunately, OpenSSL has no little part in the status quo. So let's start with the trust chain. First thing is that certificate verification is opt-in. And guess what? You have to tell OpenSSL explicitly which CAs you trust. And unfortunately, trust stores are highly platform dependent. Every OS has it elsewhere. Fortunately, there is a function that on properly configured systems <laughs> uh, will read your default trusted CAs from compiled in path. But for some very odd reason, um, it's completely undocumented. I had to dive into the OpenSSL source code to uh, verify what it's actually doing. And it also only works with file and directory-based uh, trust stores, which basically means it does not work on Windows or OS X. Well, and as if OpenSSL's obstacles weren't bad enough, our dear operating system vendors make it even a bit more miserable. So, often you have to install your trust databases by hand or you get very weird errors. So for FreeBSD, you have to install CA root NSS. On DB and Red Hat, you have the first glimpse of uh, cross-platform consistency because the package has the same name. Um, on OS 10, you can either use Apple's ancient OpenSSL, which you shouldn't, and figure out the quirks of their patched in trust evaluation agent, which cost me like a week of my life. <laughs> And, or you go with Homebrew, which actually does something nice. Uh, they just create a copy on installation of the system trust database and use that then. It's not optimal, because if you change something to your system keychain for a reason, it's not reflected, but it's better than nothing. For Windows, there's WinSert store on PyPI, which works very fine. And finally, if you want to dodge the bullet completely, 
which sometimes is the best. Uh, you can just use certify from PyPI, which is a Python package of Mozilla's trust database. So going on to uh, hostname verification, which is even worse because OpenSSL literally says <laughs> there is absolutely no assistance whatsoever from OpenSSL side to verify whether a certificate is valid for a host name. Nothing. There isn't even information on their uh, documentation. So everyone has to implement it themselves using RFCs and uh, bogus uh, advice from Stack Overflow. And <laughs> of course, it's raining security problems all the time. I mean, Python interpreter is no exception. So failing to verify certificates is really bad because it makes you extremely susceptible to man-in-the-middle attacks. So if you don't verify for certificates at all, which, as I'd like to remind you, is the, op is the uh, default, <laughs> default uh, behavior, I can pretend to be your Google with a self-signed certificate I can create in five seconds. If you verify the certificate, but don't compare host names, I can still be your Google. I, I just have to use the certificate of my homepage, which is perfectly trustworthy and valid, just not for the host name, but you won't know because you didn't look. So verify all the things. <laughs> if there's only one thing you take away from this talk, please let it be this. Everything else, especially for clients, is just mundane. Limit your acceptable ciphers to strong ones for times of poorly configured servers, like every day, and disable SSL2. That's all, and yet so few do it. It's a perfect storm of ignorance on one side, and operating systems and OpenSSL making it unnecessarily hard on the other. So, and we'll finish with the weakest link of the security chain, the users. <laughs> they can make everything fall apart, uh, no matter how much the rest of the stack tries to keep them secure. And it usually starts with fundamental misconceptions. So what does TLS actually want to do for you? For example, it's nice that your connection to your mail server or your uh, chat server is secure with the latest and greatest cipher. That's great because people won't be able to steal your passwords. Uh, keep doing it. But if the person is connected, with the, your partner is connected using a plain text connection or some intermediate server is compromised, which happens, um, your confidentiality level for this conversation is zero. And since you can't tell if that's happening, you have to always assume the worst. Uh, TLS only offers security for direct peers. You will need some additional uh, layer of security if you need confidentiality for end-to-end -end connections, for example, PGP for email or OTR for, uh, for chat. Then there's the problem that certain data can't be encrypted. If you serve a job site at your work over HTTPS, the IT will still know that you're doing it because your DNS queries and your traffic patterns will all give you away. For that, you will need a VPN or Tor to get your privacy. But a VPN routes all your traffic through their own network. So uh, you better make sure that you trust them. And this is just as well for example, applies to content delivery networks. So CDN providers can read all your traffic unencrypted because they do the TLS termination for you. So um, Fastly could sniff all your PyPI passwords if they wanted to, which they don't want because they're great guys, as Donald told me, but they could. So this is another reason to never ever reuse passwords in any case, because you never know which third party is gonna see it. So next. Uh, if you ever clicked away such a warning, you may have been MITM'd. <laughs> uh, the rule is simple, investigate the warning and then use your best judgment. So uh, if the certificate mismatches just the subdomain like here, and you know the circumstances like that Twister didn't support SNI in 2014, then you're probably fine. If the certificate is okay and um, just expired five minutes ago, you're probably fine too and can do some snarky tweets and make fun of people on the IRC. <laughs> but if you don't understand what's going on there, never accept, always decline. Man in the middle attacks are really, really easy on public networks. All it takes is a, is a rogue DHCP server. So, and the next level of clicking mindlessly is if some crook tricks you into installing their root certificate into your trust database. Because that means, that every other uh, certificate is signed with that will be considered trustworthy by your system. So you will never ever get a warning when they MITMU. And 
even if the user doesn't screw up, there's so much that can move wrong. So trust databases, this is a quick recap, is uh, what your browser queries when it tries to determine whether a certificate chain it got from the server is ultimately signed by a trustworthy CA. And it happens to be true that your browser trusts CAs, which may cause some discomfort to you. This means that the United States Department of Defense can easily sign any certificate in the world for any hostname in the world, and there will be a, a nice little lock in your navbar. And it's not like China standing back or something. Every country has some CA they can uh, compromise. And uh, it's also not unheard of, of CAs being hacked, making fatal mistakes, being forced to cooperate with authorities, or simply belonging to corporations those priorities maybe not quite match yours. So for example, just widely examples, Microsoft and Google are both CAs, whatever it means to you. And this whole system is just broken. So, <laughs> speaking of broken, <laughs> let's talk about Python now. And let's, let me start with a simple rule of thumb. As you've seen, people love to screw up TLS. So, if it's somehow possible, let the battle tested software handle it for you. Especially if you're just deploying web applications. A properly configured Nginx or Apache in front of it will sh really save you a lot of grief. Um, they are well audited, and there's uh, plenty of information on the internet how to, uh, how to configure them properly, which is simply not true for some random Python module on PyPI which just added TLS support because someone asked for it on a bug tracker. But since life usually isn't that simple, let's get our hands dirty anyway. Python's TLS landscape can be roughly divided into two parts. On the one side is the standard library's SSL module, and on the other side uh, is pipe OpenSSL. And we will start with the included batteries. And it turns out that in all versions before 3.3, they are pretty rusty. Um, and not even that, even the latest shiny version 3.4 has due to backwards compatibility requirements pretty terrible default. So for example, hostname verification is still opt-in, although the code is there. Uh, but it's a situation you wish for on Python 2, because um, the coverage of OpenSSL's APIs is really, really poor. So it's impossible to write forward secure servers in uh, with the standard library's SSL module, which means you should never ever write as TLS servers with, open with the <coughs> standard library. It's also missing a bunch of options, so you can't disable SSL2, you can't disable uh, TLS compression. It's all very sad. And finally, um, it's bound to the uh, OpenSSL your Python is, is uh, built against. So if you want a new OpenSSL version, you have to recompile your Python, which is not very nice. What's also missing in 2.7 is hostname verification, and I think I've stressed enough how important that is. So that has been added in Python 3.2, and fortunately, it has been backported for Python 2 and is available on PyPI. However, you have to remember, install it, use it. It's double opt-in. PyOpenSSL comes from a time when standard libraries SSL support was even worse than what we have now. I think it even started its life before it had even existed. I'm not quite sure there. Um, it runs on all relevant Python versions. And although it has been a bit dormant over the time, um, it has a much better uh, API coverage than uh, the standard library on Python 2. The only notable omission of ECD, <laughs> sorry, the only notable omission is currently ECDHE for servers, but the pull, re pull request is there, and I, um, I have high hopes that this will get merged in its sprints. But what's more important, a new project gave PyOpenSSL a new Viger, cryptography. If you've been to the talk of Paul and Jared, um, which if you were, you should watch the video because it's highly interesting. You may have already heard about it. It's a bunch of Python people with more time than sense and with a <laughs> and which favor bad life decisions um, came together to write a Python crypto library without food guns because we don't have such thing. Um, a side product of that, a PyPy friendly CFFI bindings for OpenSSL. So. And it's trivial to choose your OpenSSL version, and um, other backends like Secure Transport are in the works. 
So get your good or fail in Python 2. Um, this gave PyOpenMS some serious momentum because they could throw out all their rusty C code and concentrate on building Python abstractions on top of that. So PyOpenSSL is since the last release a Python only version, which a uh, Python only package, which is nice. Uh, what's unfortunately missing there is hostname verification. <laughs> Maybe you see a pattern here. Although, in this case, uh, PyOpenMS really tries to be a wrapper for the APIs, so I'm, I would cut them some slack here, but yeah. But again, help is on PyPI. Service identity gives you just that, plus some more obscure ways to verify the identity of a server, um, which nobody will ever use, but they are specified in an RFC, so there it is. And uh, again, double opt-in. Install, use. And let's look at, uh, no, let's drink some water first. Mm. Let's look at common frameworks and packages and how well behaved TLS um, citizens they are. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we will start with service again. Event like G-Event, G-Unicorn, and Tornado all suffer from the same disease, which is called the standard library. Uh, they cannot have PFS, they cannot have good defaults because they can't even set the options. So put an Nginx in front of all of them. Um, Twisted is <laughs> uh, probably one of the few legit reasons to cope with TLS yourself, since it's used to implement much more protocols than just, um, just HTTPS. Um, a little known fact of Twisted is that it ships with a nice whiskey container. So in other words, you can deploy... <laughs> <laughs> you, you can deploy HTTPS web applications with it um, without putting anything in front of it and still have great TLS support. And I can assure you um, that deploying whiskey apps on Twisted does not mean that you have to use callbacks, deferreds, or use camel case in your code. <laughs> so, finally, micro whiskey. It's not Python specific, despite the convincing name. Um, so they just went on and wrote them C themselves. So that made them the masters of their own fate, and indeed their implementation looks pretty much fully featured. I personally would al still always put an Nginx in front of it, because I have a general distrust towards um, OpenSSL using C code. Well, your mileage may vary, but it shouldn't really. So the only way to fix all these red daggers there is to either move to Python 3, write your own SSL support like MicroWiski, or um, port to PyOpenSSL. As long as we stay on, uh, on the standard library of Python 2, they are going to stay. Well, maybe not, but I'll talk about it later. So, client side, event and gevent, uh, they are just as bad as before, although it is possible to do better despite the standard library. And Tornado shows how. They ship a not entirely outdated trust database from Mozilla and depend on the hostname, match uh, hostname matching um, backport from PyPI. So, they verify certificates and host names by default. Imagine without writing a pep and engaging the trolls on Python ideas. But on the other hand, they still run into problems like the inability to disable SSL2 because that option has been added in Python 3.2. That causes some really funny errors when you try to connect to certain servers on OS 10, which still has SSL2 inside. You just get a protocol error and you don't know what's happening there. Um, yeah, twisted uh, client side is complicated. Not for the reasons you might think. Deferreds are awesome and camel case just doesn't matter after a while. <laughs> it's complicated because nobody less than Glyph conspired with our current release manager, Hawk Ole, to sabotage my preparations. <laughs> he frankly started uh, to pull all nighters after he saw my original slides that suggested to use a third party library from within Deferred to Threat. And um, the current state, as of this morning when I checked the last time, um, <laughs> is that there are opt-in, opt-in, low-level ways to verify all the things. So the plumbing is there. This is great. However, the higher-level APIs like the HTTP agent or SSL endpoint are still oblivious by default. Um, this is not optimal, but at least it is possible to write secure code, which is was not possible before 14.0, and. Yeah, we take these issues really seriously, so uh, this is gonna get fixed. It's all it's all underway, 
and I expect to, uh, that 14.1 will be pretty good. What's never going to be good is the standard library's URL lib. <laughs> um, it doesn't verify anything. Um, it doesn't set any options. Just hands off if you ever have to open an HTTPS URL with it. Instead, use requests. <laughs> Something. Oh man, I have to hurry up. Something uh, that request is great because of its simple API. Um, what I li like even more is that it uses Eurolib 3 to get the best possible results. So it always veri verifies the certificates, it always verifies the host names, and everything just gets better when you install PyOpenSSL and a few other uh, modules. Yeah. So let me sum up. Keep TLS out of Python if you can. Use requests for HTTPS queries. Make sure you're using the PyOpenSSL backed version. And write TLS servers and twist it. If you need low level TLS, use the latest version of PyOpenSSL. It's greatly superior to Python 2's SSL module, and it will follow you faithfully if you ever port to Python 3. Finally, use the Python 2 standard library only for client and only if you really need to. Um, and needless to say, whatever you use, Make sure you use the relevant backports and tools to verify all the things. So, <laughs> let's answer the question from the very beginning. Why is the state of SSL sorry? It's sorry because people still say SSL, although it's been obsolete for 15 years. <laughs> it's sorry because the implementations are terrible. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> I'm not sure if you expected me to rant for an hour about how and why the implementations are terrible. That might have been fun, but um, it's not a very constructive way to, uh, of my speaking time, so let's leave it at that. If the state of OpenSSL makes you angry, which really should, uh, consider donating to the project or tell your boss to donate to the project, because it's literally three guys and one of them works full time. So it's better than it could be. So. It's sorry because users run outdated software. They click cer uh, certificates warnings away, and they are at the mercy of third parties. And those third parties let them down regularly. Servers run completely outdated software that is confi configured completely poorly. Clients don't verify anything, although it's their only job. And <laughs> we're not talking here about some obscure freeware here. Uh, this January, IOActive found 40% of tested banking apps to be vulnerable to MITM attacks. And uh, finally, it's sorry because Python is at the forefront of being terrible. The current state really is sorry even without heartbleed. Uh, this, the title of this talk is not attention bait, but there's hope. First of all, people started to care and question, so that's probably why you're here. Um, acceptance is always the first step. <laughs> <laughs> Standard library support got better by magnitude since the 3.3 release. So if you ever needed a reason for Python 3 for your boss, here you go. And even for Python 2.7, Nick Coglan is working on a pep that should bring the SSL module roughly into uh, 2014. So there goes your argument for Python 3 again. <laughs> um, I've already mentioned the cryptography project. But it's much more than that. In a proud tradition of the Python Packaging Authority, a Python Cryptography Authority form, formed around of it. Uh, we've already adopted several projects, and it's supposed to be the one-stop place for solid crypto software for Python. Uh, this is a really huge deal, because the standard library simply moves too slowly to respond to the pressing issues of security. Um, but hope also means there's work to do. Therefore, my calls to action. Stop believing that the lock icon makes you and your data safe. Do not click away certificate warnings away. Do not install rogue root certificates. Be a critical user. Configure your servers properly. Install security updates immediately. If you connect to servers, verify, the ser <coughs> verify certificates and host names. And finally, help us to get Python out of this mess. Fix your libraries, fix your software, report bugs to upstream, help upstream fixing these bugs. There's really a lot of do to do do. And that's all I had for you today. I hope you learned something and more importantly are eager to fix things now. So go out, study the talk page, follow me on Twitter, get your domains from Viromedia, and look out for the crypto open space that will happen probably tomorrow. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we have no time for questions, but where will you be, Hinnick? Yeah, catch me, uh, catch me outside. I will have a real cryptographer next to me who will, uh, <laughs> will kick me if I'm going to say something wrong. I wouldn't have been comfortable to answer you on the record anyway, so catch me outside. Thank you very much. <laughs>